Okay, good evening. So tonight we're looking at the Dhammapada again with verses 195 and 196, which read as follows. Pujarahe pujayato bundhe yadi chasavake papancha samati kante tinna soka paridave te tadi se pujayato nimbuto akuto baye nasaka punyang sankhatum ime tamapi kenachi which means one who worships someone who is worship, worthy of worship whether it's a buddha or one of a buddha, one of the buddha's disciples those those both of whom whether it's a buddha or one of his disciple one of their disciples who has gone beyond papancha which is well, we'll talk about what that is papancha is proliferation or uh, making more out of things than they actually are one who has crossed over or gone beyond sorrow and lamentation. When one worships such a being, such a being as these, one who is nibuta means released or extinguished. Akutobaya, one who is free from fear or has no fear left, no danger left to them. When one worships such a person, nasaka punyang sankatung, it's not possible to count the goodness by anyone. Imitamapi. You couldn't say this much, such, so much. No one could. I mean, you can't count how much. Basically, there's infinite greatness that comes from worshipping someone who is worth worshipping. So this was told in regards to a story of the Buddha. It's another very short story. The Buddha was traveling. And in his travels, he came to a shrine. And nearby, there was a farmer, a Brahmin, who was plowing the field. And the Buddha said to his disciples, said, invite that Brahmin to come over and let's have a word with him. You know, in the Buddha's, in the Buddha's life, he, he seemed to have this ability to find people. And it was part of his mission to go out and find people who were spiritually... Mm, advanced or enlightened or ready ready to they were open to hearing the truth open to understanding themselves understanding reality people who didn't have very strong views but maybe just had views that needed tweaking people who generally had a lot of goodness in them it's often hard to know how much goodness is in a person when they come to meditate just because their views are right or their views are wrong. It's an interesting experience having people come to meditate and never be sure what the result is going to be. Some people don't last a few days even though they might have the best of intentions and other people who have everything all wrong come and end up staying for quite a long time because it, it, it benefits them, they see the benefit. They say it's often harder to change right views. It's often harder to practice if you have right view. Because you think you know everything and you aren't able to make the transition from theoretical knowledge or philosophical knowledge to actual understanding. So 
the people with the wrong view because as soon as they start to practice it butts up against everything they've held dear. It's very easy for them to uh, progress because it's very easy to see that they're on the wrong path. A person who has right view, it's hard to see that they're missing something. Harder to see. Harder to see the benefit. Anyway. The Buddha found people who he could see were ready. They had a lot, done a lot of good things and they were very pre well prepared. Good people. So this Brahmin seemed to have been such a person, but he had a bit of a problem and it was sort of an opening. The Brahmin came to the Buddha and we saw the Buddha sitting there. He didn't have any interest in paying respect or worshipping the Buddha, but he turned to the shrine that the Buddha was sitting at and he paid reverence to the shrine before sitting down to talk to the Buddha. And the Buddha said, why do you pay respect to this shrine? It was a very good opening to start talking about the Dhamma, I guess. And he explained that this shrine here has been in our family from generation to generation, and I revere it and worship it as part of our tradition. And the Buddha praised him. It's quite remarkable. You might not have thought he would, but he said, you do good by paying respect to this shrine. And the monks asked, well, what, what the heck, you know, why, why is the Buddha praising him for worshipping this shrine? And the story is not quite clear, but he tells an ancient story. He tells one of the suttas. It's an old story about in the time of Mahakasapa, or the time of Kasapa, sorry, Kasapa Buddha, when the Bodhisattva, the, who was to become the Buddha, was a Brahmin named Jyotipala, and he had a friend named Gati, Gatikara. Anyway, it's an old story. Well, it's an old ancient story that the Buddha told of how they went to see the Buddha and how uh, Jyotipala became a monk under the, under the Buddha Kasapa. I'm not, I'm not quite sure, uh, but the story starts with um, the Buddha smiling at a certain place and Ananda asks him why he's smiling and, he, and then he tells this story. He says, this was the place where Mahakasapa, I can't remember what, something, something in Mahakasapa's life. And then he told the story of Katikara and Jyotipala. And so I'm not sure if this shrine was the same place or if it was just another place or, or what have you. Anyway, it's not really important because what the Buddha says next is more important. And he says, you know, it's good that you're worshipping this shrine, but it would be much better if you were to just worship one of these monks sitting here. And he's making a point by that. Then he tells this he tells this verse, but he's making a point there that the things that we worship, uh, sometimes have no benefit or no meaning to them. When you worship something based on tradition, he may have just been praising him for following his traditions, but when you do that, um, the benefit is highly inferior to actually doing something meaningful. And when you worship a, a living person, um, someone who is, who, especially someone who is doing good deeds, the, the, the difference, of course, is much greater. So there's a couple of things we can say about this. We should talk a little bit about worship and veneration and respect, but we also want to talk, I think, more importantly for meditation, about the reasons for worshiping a particular person or, or even a thing. As the Buddha does say, it's not just about worshipping living people, living beings. Uh, the, the, he, he, in this story, it says that he, he brought up the teaching on the different types of people who are worthy of, uh, worthy of worship, worthy of erecting a, a stupa, a, a, a monument. And then he talks about different kinds of monuments and how worshipping monuments is a good thing as well. So. This shrine, of course, was just another monument, but uh, the qualities that make a person worthy of such a monument and worthy of worshipping a monument of them 
are, are interesting to us because they again provide us with some outline of, of the Buddha's teaching. So veneration, of course, is a very big part of religion, what we call religion. was well, one of the things we take seriously in, in religion. It's one of the things that religion, one of the aspects of what makes religion what it is, the, the taking seriously not just of practices or uh, abstentions, but also of objects, teachers, um, deities, angels, these sorts of things. Right? In religion, we, there are always objects of, of reverence and respect. And in Buddhism, the Buddha is, is our, one of our main objects of reverence and respect. Now, many Buddhists don't uh, involve themselves in reverence or, or respect to any great degree, especially in, in the West in modern times. People who take up mindfulness practice often omit this part. And I'm not here to tell you that you have to or that it's, they're missing something. I mean, I think you could say that someone is missing something by not engaging in worship. Uh, but they're not missing something necessary. But you, I think you could say that worship and worship of the Buddha is a good thing. You know, the Buddha says here in the sutta that it's a, it's a, a, a goodness or a merit without limit. Without, uh, it's an infinite amount of goodness. I, I, can, I can explain why I think that is. But first, just to talk about the quality of goodness. And even if you don't buy into religion and you're very pragmatic about meditation, it's very pragmatic to, to worship. The, I think the, re the bigger reason why we're often afraid to worship is because uh, of the brainwashing that's involved, the handing your, your or leaving your, your doubt and your skepticism at the door, right? But... What if you found an object that was perfect? Now, of course, you can't know that it's perfect, and so keeping your skepticism is good, but what if, if you found an object that is perfect, then it wouldn't matter, matter if you were skeptical. In fact, the skepticism would be a hindrance if that object were perfect. So, to some degree, uh, leaving behind some amount of skepticism is, is very useful, and if you're able to leave behind all your skepticism, well, uh, you better hope that the object is worth it. Now, we think that the Buddha is worth it, so we do drop a lot of our skepticism. Now, it's important to understand we don't have the Buddha here in front of us, and the teachings are coming through a filter of who knows what. And so a little bit of skepticism is still healthy. But the great benefit that comes from it, really just giving it, giving yourself up, and they've talked about this before. This is why we have opening ceremonies. And we will hopefully start to do opening ceremonies for people who want them. But part of the opening ceremony is giving yourself over to the Buddha, giving yourself over to the teacher. You actually give your whole being to them, as a, like, like give ownership to them kind of thing. And I mean, it's not as, as ominous sounding as that, but it's it's really a... Psycho I mean, it's psychological is the point. When you do that, you are fully committing uh, to the practice. And, and the benefit, of course, is, um, on, is, is in line with that because all of the holding back that you might do because of doubt or because of skepticism is gone. Uh, another par aspect of it is the humility. And this is, again, even from a pragmatic point of view, psychologically, if we use the word psychologically. Of course, Buddhism and goodness and religion is all psychological. Um, but psychologically, humility is, of course, a very good thing. And just from a pragmatic point of view, paying respect to someone else is, is, is humbling. As Buddhist monks, we pay respect to monks who are senior to us. We don't pay respect, uh, tech, what's the word, um, by the rules, 
we don't pay respect according to merit, according to goodness. Now, of course, if there's a monk or, or even not a monk, an ordin a non-monk who you respect and who is worthy of respect, you should respect them because that's the real the Buddha or his his disciples are the you know those who are enlightened, not those who are in robes. But I bring this up because uh, sometimes you have to pay respect to a monk who is, well, maybe you don't think too highly of him, or maybe he's not too pure. Um, but doing so is very humbling, and keeping to the rules is humbling, and it, it's not degrading because you're not really paying respect to the person, you're paying respect to the rules and to the to the community and to the station and to the goodness of being ordained as a monk and that sort of thing. On the other hand, you have people who refuse to bow down, not just to people who they can see are, are corrupt and immoral, but they also refuse to bow down to people like to the Buddha image or to their teachers, for example. And, uh, and, and, and I'm not saying that those people should be ostracized. It's not, a, it's not like that. It's that those people are, are very conceited, you know, very arrogant. You know, that's the reason. They, I'm equal to you. Why should I bow down? Right? And okay, you don't have to bow down, but you not bowing down is encouraging this conceit and arrogance and, and so on. So the, the psychological benefit of bowing down and, and humbling yourself because it... it allows you to give up your attachment itself is very great and shouldn't be underestimated. But, but this isn't why we're here, and this isn't why you've come here to learn about how to pay homage. I mean, I think it's useful, and it's for your edification, that you should think about religious qualities and just religion in general, as it's generally understood when we talk about this word religion, the idea of Buddhism and being a religious person is, is good, it's beneficial. The, the scary problems with, with religion come when it, it loses sight of what's right and when it's involved with corruption and corrupt people and teachings and so on. If the teachings are all good and, and pure, then it's really not something you should ever worry about. And there's great benefit to being religious, paying homage and worship and that sort of thing. Um, but Buddha, the Buddha wasn't um, fixed and focused on, on reverence either. And um, the reason, of course, for, bring, for him bringing it up and, and focusing on it is because the Brahmin was engaging in worship. So it's a great way to find an inn, you know, to, to open up the conversation. But what he says is important. I mean, these verses are very brief, but... He mentions four words, and these four words sort of give us an idea, not just of who we should worship, but who we should become to be worthy of worship, worthy of respect. You don't, it's not like you come here because you want people to worship you. But absolutely, what we should want to become is something worthy of respect. We shouldn't want to become something that's not worthy of respect, not because we want respect, but because absolutely. If I come out of here as someone who's not worthy of respect, I've done a bad thing. We come here worthy of not so much respect, and hopefully when, once we've practiced, we've done things that are praiseworthy. It's a very good way of describing um, and describing the, the, the criteria that makes something good. Not because you get praised for it, but because you're worthy of being praised for it. Just because, no, maybe people blame you for it. You went to meditate, you wasted all that time. But you're not, you don't deserve that. The good things that you've done are worthy of praise, and the good things you're doing every day here are worthy of praise. So I praise you. I respect you. So what are those qualities? So the Buddha says, um, who has overcome, what is it, papancha samatikante, who has overcome papancha. So it's an opportunity to talk a little bit about papancha. When we talk about mindfulness and insight, the, the reason for practicing mindfulness, to, to gain, not insight, but clear sight, to see things clearly, uh, is, 
is to counteract or to is in opposition of this idea of papancha. Papancha, as I said, means making more out of something than it actually is. And that's a very concise description of what we mean by um, the problem, what, what, we're, what we're aiming to change in regards to the, the reason why we suffer, the causes of suffering. So when you have pain, I mean, it's a very simple concept, but it, it, it's really very core. When you have pain, the problem isn't the pain, the problem is how you react to the pain, how you extrapolate. It's a problem, it's my pain, it's bad, it's going to hurt me, going to injure me, it's, I have to fix this, so what we think about it. Instead of just saying this is pain, and so when we say to ourselves pain, pain, we're reminding ourselves that that's pain, that's what sati means, mindfulness. Sat, sati means to remind yourself or to remember, oh yeah, it's just pain. The Buddha even said it explicitly. He said, when you see, let it just be seeing. The opposite is when you see and you say, oh, wow, that's beautiful. I want that. I should get that. That's mine. That's yours. That's, or that's bad. I don't like that. That shouldn't be like that. That's ugly. All the things we say about everything. So if you're confused or unsure about what is this we're doing, it's quite simple. Why are you repeating this mantra to yourself? It's not magic. It's reminding yourself. It's trying to cultivate and evoke states of mind that are um, that are are one to one, where you where seeing is just seeing, hearing is just hearing, pain is just pain, thinking is just thinking. So someone who has overcome has gone beyond papancha. Is someone who has come to see things just as they are. We, this is a very sort of it's easy to just toss, toss this phrase, I guess cliché is the word, this phrase, see things as they really are. Uh, and, and I think many religious and spiritual practices, spiritual paths talk about this, but we really do mean this in a very simple way. But when you see seeing as seeing, that's what it means to see things as they are. The problem isn't that we don't know what things are, it's that we don't see things the way they are. You know that seeing is seeing, anyone does. If we talk about it, if I say, what is seeing? Um, you'll, you know, if I push you out to it, you'll say, well, seeing is seeing. But we don't see it that way. Right? When we see something immediately, we papancha, we, we extrapolate. So that's one of the great qualities. The second one is dinna soka paridove, which means having overcome sorrow and lamentation. So here, it's again very brief, and he's not. it's not just sorrow and lamentation, but it means suffering, because papancha, this extrapolating and making more of things, is what gets us all mixed up in, in imagination, really, an imaginary world of right and wrong and good and bad and me and mine and all sorts of problems and stresses. There's nothing to worry about when seeing is just seeing, hearing is just hearing. So if you can cultivate and create this, if you can grow within yourself this ability to see things just as they are, there's no, no sorrow and lamentation. Nibbutta, nibbutte akutobaye. Nibbutta means um, extinguished. So suffering is often likened to a fire and one who becomes enlightened has put out the fire it's it's a, i think it's a it's an important fire is an important uh, image here because if you take a piece of furniture say furniture is good you know you can sit on it you can put your coffee on it you if it's a rug you can stand on it lie on it but when it's on fire well you try to put the fire out if your hair was on fire, or your hat was on fire, your turban was on fire, your clothes were on fire, you'd want to put them out. Fire is something problematic in many situations, circumstances. So if your mind is on fire, just put all you need to do, you don't need to change your mind or get rid of your thoughts or your emotions even, just put out the fire. I mean, emotions to some extent are, are part of the fire, but not all of them. You only have to put out the ones that are causing suffering. You have to put out the fire. Craving, clinging, aversion, anger, conceit, arrogance, all the 
ones that we really know are bad. So it's it's hard not to know that these things are problematic. Akuto baya means free from or without fear. Also means without danger. Baya can mean fear or danger, and it's interchangeable. But um, it, it really means the same thing either way. What it means is you're safe. These people who who have done this are have become safe because you can't free yourself from pain. You can't escape pain as long as you're alive. You can't escape circumstances that are problematic, that are dangerous, that are you can't escape danger, right? Not physically. The only way. So so the question of how to overcome suffering it seems like an impossible task. I think many people would not even ever think to make that their goal. You don't hear any other religious teacher claiming that. Oh yes, we're practicing, we're going to teach you how to free yourself from suffering. They don't describe it that way because it's a fairly bold claim. You think, how is it possible? You can't escape danger, you can't escape problems. But it's quite simple, it's not a hard to understand concept. It just means you change the way you're looking at it. So instead of escaping pain, you stop reacting to the pain. Akutobaya means not that you have no more pain or no more difficulty. It doesn't mean you leave here and everyone's nice to you all of a sudden. It means that when people are not nice to you or when they are wicked and evil, you don't react in the same way as you did. You don't react at all. Seeing is seeing, hearing is hearing, and it all comes down to simple experience. Everything. And when you can see that, when you can experience, when you can experience experience just as experience, and not as me or mine or good or bad, etc., then nothing, you're invincible. Nothing can harm you. And the last part of the verse, the second verse is that no one can, no one can count how much goodness comes from, from worshipping such a person. Remember, we're not talking about just us developing these, we're talking about worshipping such a person. So there are people who have done this, who have accomplished this, and when you worship them, it's limitless. But why is it limitless? It's limitless because worship in Buddhism, the Buddha, before he passed away, everyone was coming to worship with flowers and candles and incense, and the Buddha said, this isn't how you worship. Worship is practice. When you practice the Dhamma, practice the teachings, practice someone's teachings in order to realize the goal of the teachings. That's when you, that's true worship. And so this is, I think, a, a part of worship. When you see Buddhists uh, paying homage to the Buddha image and so on, you can think of it as sort of a start. You know, many of them might not get very far in this life, but all of this is pulling you along. When, when we think of what people worship and respect, let's step back from religion and focus on um, ordinary, ordinary wor uh, respect and, and idol, what you, idolization. So there's this show called American Idol, right? that kind of thing. When you idolize someone, we idolize actors, singers, sports people. When I was young, we idolized the cool kids, whoever was cool or, or uh, confident, maybe athletic or so on. We idolize these people. So, so when you idolize, um, say, a singer or a, an actor or a rock star, imagine what that's doing from a, from a meditative perspective, what that's doing to the person's mind. Well, they're... they're um, holding up or they're, they're uh, esteeming the qualities of that person who might be a drug addict or, or, or any number of things. And, and when on the other hand some people will, will pay respect, to, you know, there are some famous people who are, um, who are very good and who do good things, then on the other hand they're esteeming those good qualities. When we move on to religion, if you pay homage, like in some religions, they'll pay homage in Judaism, we pay, we worship a god, and it's become really 
sickening to me to, to think about that because this God is just the, the worst example of, of evil that you could possibly imagine, just the, the cruelty. And then you wonder, you know, this is, this is who we're meant to worship? And, and as a result, it, it, it isn't pure. It isn't perfect. It's not something that should be worshipped because you're esteeming the qualities of evil espoused by that God. If you have other religious um, religious teachers, then you're, you're holding in your mind up the qualities of that person. And that's what it ultimately comes down to. When we pay respect to the Buddha, we're not worshipping him per se. We're not supposed to be. We're supposed to be worshipping his qualities. That's when we when we chant in front of the Buddha, we remember his qualities. And so the, the, the limitlessness comes from the fact that the qualities that espoused by, or not espoused, um, held by the Buddha uh, were, were, had, had no limit to them. If you worship someone, let's say, who, who has lots of money, and you know you, you you idolize someone because they know how to get rich. Maybe they're clever. Okay, so then you put those qualities up, and you can be clever, and you can go and make lots of money. But there's a limit to that. There's a limit to the goodness and the greatness of those qualities. If you revere someone who is good, who is generous and kind and loving, like I don't know, Princess Diana or something. Uh, I wanted, I did, yeah, any, any person who is, I think Keanu Reeves is supposed to be really good. Um, some of these, some of these famous people, Barack Obama maybe, I don't know. Uh, it, it, someone who, is, who, who you see, ah, these people are not good examples. Uh, Gandhi, but Gandhi isn't even a good example. Martin Luther King maybe. Was, Martin Luther King I think was a good example. He had real goodness. But if you find someone who is good, who, who has good qualities and is generous and compassionate and kind and wishes for all, be, all people to, to respect each other, um, to, to be as brothers and sisters, like Martin Luther King said. There's a limit to that still. The limit might be peace on earth for a while. It's not can't be permanent. It might be heaven. You might be reborn in a pure, in a more happy place. If you revere spiritual people for magical powers or concentration or their ability to sit still for a long period of time, then it has a limit. The limit to those qualities is the Brahma realms. But the qualities of papancha, if you, the qualities of overcoming papancha is limitless because it, it doesn't end. It frees you. It's not something that you get to a point and then you've you eventually fall back down. It changes you. It changes the very fabric of your reality because it's based on wisdom and, and simple wisdom, just understanding of things as they are that you can never go back on. You can never stop understanding things the way they are. Not when you have the perfect clarity of vision that comes from mindfulness and, and vipassana. So the, the the limitless quality of the goodness of of worshiping comes from the fact that you worship those qualities and you hold those up as your your ultimate goal. When you worship someone else, you're worshiping those qualities and and you're you're putting those qualities forth in yourself, and it changes you. It makes you more inclined towards that practice. So, paying homage to the Buddha, homage to uh, enlightened beings like Sariputta and so on. It's a good thing. There's benefit there. But ultimately, the Buddha said, this isn't paying respect to these beings. If you really do esteem and believe these are the people I want to follow, then follow them. Practice and, and realize for yourself the qualities that they, um, that they evince, is that the word, that they, that they have. So that's the Dhammapada verse for tonight. That's the Dhamma. Thank you all for listening. <laughs>